Starting Overdrive. Real stories of starting over with Red Seaton. Hey everyone, welcome to Starting Overdrive, where you'll hear real stories of starting over from real people of all walks of life. I'm your host, Reg Seaton. Dealing with change can often be sudden, extreme, unforeseen, and beyond one's control. In relation to starting over, it's rare to have incredible highs in life without also experiencing incredible lows. When following our passions into a career, we spend a lot of time trying to reach the top of our mountains in our chosen fields. Sometimes we get to the top of that mountain early in life and unexpectedly find ourselves walking back down into unknown valleys, staring up at the challenge of climbing new mountains we couldn't see. And sometimes we get knocked off the mountain just as we arrive at the top, only to have to start the journey all over again, each time creating growth, wisdom, confidence, and deeper strength in oneself. In this episode of Starting Overdrive, I speak with legendary singer, Juno Award nominee, and Queen of Scream, Darby Mills, who rose to fame in 1982 as the frontwoman of the Canadian group The Headpins, with the release of the Turn It Loud album, which sold a million copies worldwide, topped the charts for six weeks, and produced the hit single Don't It Make You Feel. The Headpins' next single, Just One More Time, for Line of Fire in 1983, spent nine weeks on the Billboard Hot 100 and solidified Darby as one of the premier singers in rock and the band as a musical force in the early to mid-80s. As you'll discover, Darby's career and success in music took her to the highest peaks in the business, working with some of the biggest names in music, but also some of the lowest valleys after being forced to start over multiple times from opportunities lost due to unfortunate circumstances. As well, in the midst of dealing with extreme change in her career, Darby also faced a few personal setbacks with her family that also forced her to start over and look at life from a new perspective. Today, Darby is still going strong with her own band, The Darby Mills Project, but the Queen of Scream is no stranger to overcoming adversity and what it takes to survive and thrive after starting over. Find out how Darby Mills started over from it all in the latest episode of Starting Overdrive. Darby Mills, welcome to Starting Overdrive. You got that right. (laughs) I have to admit that when I came up with the idea for the show, you were paramount on my mind because of your story. So I'm grateful that you're doing this today. You know what? I think that with everything that's happened, not just career-wise, but in this COVID year, that the support that artists and people in the industry, public entertainment or knowledge or whatever you want to call it, if we don't support each other, then there's no support. There's no support for us because everybody else is so busy trying to hang on to whatever a semblance of normalcy that they have in their lives right now. That Although I think there's lots of people that would go out and see concerts, but I think there's lots of people that are scared that wouldn't. So thank you for thinking of me. And yeah, everybody's got to be supportive of everybody right now. There's so little love going on in the world right now. So right back at you. Thank you. Hey, no problem. I just want to start from a back to front and get to what you just mentioned about the industry. But when your career really took off in 1982 with the release of Turn It Loud and the success you had with Don't Make You Feel, looking back, how prepared were you as a person to deal with everything you experienced from the time you joined the headpins to the time you left? Every different stage of my life, I would have a different answer for that. Now that I'm over 60, My children are at that stage and age that I was back then. I'm boggled that I did as well as I did. I was not prepared. I had no idea what was coming. I signed four or five contracts that signed my life away in that period of time. You know, I have tales of woe, and there isn't a musician or an artist out there that doesn't have tales of woe. Artists are put on this planet, I believe, to suffer. That's how you become an artist, is that you share your suffering. (laughs) I did that. I went through wonderful highs and terrible, terrible lows. And by the time I was 25, within the year of being 25, turning to 26, I had fallen into a depression. I had been sued for the headpin debt. I had been picked up and dropped by a label. It's just boggling what I actually went through. But 
you only survive if you're strong enough to survive. So I'm grateful that whoever gave me whatever ignorance that I had, because I do believe that's how I came into the business was because I was ignorant. And I'm still here today trying to, as the saying goes, one foot in front of the other. When you were growing up, becoming a young adult, what type of association did you have with change? I mean, did you have a strong understanding of just how much nothing stays the same forever? I don't think so. I was born here in Vernon and moved away in grade seven and moved to Kamloops and started grade seven. So in elementary school at a new school, I'm highly allergic to mosquito bites. And of course, that night I woke up the, the first morning at, at a new school, grade seven, didn't know a soul, having had a, a mosquito bite right in the middle of my forehead. So I swelled up. Both my eyes were almost full and shut, and I had to walk into my brand new grade seven class looking like uh, Frankenstein. That was fairly traumatic. I didn't make a lot of friends the first week, but you know what? You learn from that. <laughs> so for me, that was the only change I had in my life until I graduated and then moved away. And since then, you become aware of the fact that nothing stays the same, and yet everything is the same. That old saying. In the 80s and 90s, that phase of your career, there's a really strong theme of starting over, not by your own choice, but more by circumstances beyond your control. Is it easier to accept change when there's nothing you can do about it? Well, it's a sink or swim. At that time, it had been 10, 11 years that I had been singing for my paycheck. And I did after being let go by the headpins and getting the solo deal and then having that come to an abrupt halt, losing my deal. And that wasn't necessarily my fault, although it was a new A&R president for MCA California or USA, I guess. A new head came into the department and it was either break me, the old guy's sign, or bring in a sign of his own, which ended up being Tiffany. So. I lost my American contract, first solo contract to Tiffany. And so after that, I came home and then lost my management deal. And yeah, at that point, I fell into a terrible depression and spent about four months just laying in bed thinking I had failed. And thanks to some wonderful, crazy friends that pulled me out of bed and said, you know what, just come jam. You just got to follow your heart because as I've learned later on in life, tomorrow is not a guarantee. You got to lick your wounds a little bit, but after that, it's like, okay, what do you want to do? There's no alternative to sink or swim, right? So put on your big girl panties and just go do it. Those are definitely words to live by. Can you talk a bit about what it felt like way back in the early days when you left Steelback to start over with the headpins? What was that decision process like when you were starting over at that point? Well, to me, that wasn't starting over. When I got the phone call, Brian McLeod and the guys had come out to see Steelback at a club, a well-known club. Those are in the days when you worked seven days a week or more. And I didn't think it was strange. I thought it was odd somewhat, but I figured they'd come out to see our guitar player, who was fairly renowned at the time in Steelback. And they talked to me a little bit, and it was like, hi, yeah, whatever. Then a week and a half later, I get a phone call where... Steelback was in Calgary, Edmonton, one of the two. And I'm like, yeah, Mike's not in this room with me. You might want to talk to him. And Brian said, no, I want to talk to you. And I'm like, okay. And he's like, I want you to join the band. Take your time. I'm going to call you on Sunday. It was Friday. And you can let me know what your decision is. So we hung up the phone. And at that point, to me, the opportunity to work with such established artists. And at the time, they were just a club act. Chilliwack had gone into a tailspin because Shelley Siegel had passed away from Mushroom Records. And so all that label was just in free fall. And so Chilliwack was in the midst of doing an album at the time and they had to stop. They didn't know what was going on. So McLeod had started the head pins just to keep the chops up. I'm assuming stop from going stir crazy. So they'd been in the bar for about six months or eight months and let go of their original singer and called me up and said, come do the gig. So in the meantime, they got signed by Solid Gold Records and Solid Gold Records came out to see Chilliwack and then saw the headpins in the bar. They came out to party one night. Next thing I know, I was being signed to Solid Gold Records and into the studio we went to record the Turn It Loud album. So it wasn't starting over. It was taking a step up the ladder, in my opinion, and at great peril because just about everybody I knew said, 
you're going to regret it because they're going to dump you as soon as Chilliwack's out of the studio and nobody's going to touch you for leaving Steelback. So it was like, okay, do I not take this opportunity or do I risk everything just to have the experience to work with the standard of player that was in the headpins at the time? So I took the chance and the story's out now. How is your association to risk evolved after everything you've been through, the highs and the lows? It's very hard to move forward if you're not willing to take the risk. I think if you're always playing it safe, that's what your return is going to be as well. Safe, which usually means not enough to pay the bills. Or the growth factor when you play it safe is, of course, very limited. So it's not an easy move in my way of looking at it. It's not something that I say, oh, yay, change, let's do it. I fight change as often as I can, but I also understand that it's essential for growth. When you released Turn It Loud and that album sold a million copies worldwide, how did you adapt to the changes of being so visible, being recognized, and having a level of fame? Was that a difficult adjustment? You know what? In those five years that I was in the recording version of the Headpins, it was playing the bars six days a week, four weeks a month, writing, getting the deal, booking the studio time at Little Mountain, going in with three songs written and writing the rest of the songs while we were there. Of course, McLeod did the gist of the writing, but he would let me write lyrics occasionally. And then as soon as that was done, it would be pressed. We'd go into a rehearsal, make sure we knew those songs that were written during the studio, and boom, we were on tour. By the time we finished four or five months of touring, whether it be in Canada, the States, or over in Europe, it was come home and the studio time is booked, get your butts into the studio, write another album, record that album get out, learn those songs, and then go out on tour. So that happened three times, and that sucked up four years. And the fifth year we kind of toured, we did the ZZ Top tour, and on that tour I'd pretty much gone from being the apprentice, the learnee, to someone who thought they knew something and kind of started standing up to the powers that be for what I felt to be right. And it cost me my job. And I'm not saying anyone was right or wrong, but I stood up for myself and I stood up for what I, injustices that I thought that were going on and it cost me. And so at that point I was told uh, I no longer have a gig with the headpins, but I retained the actual contract with MCA in the States and that they were sending me over to London, England to record a solo album. So, you know, like bang, bang, a slap upside the head and then a plane ticket to London to work at Pete Townsend's studio. And the producer was Greg Walsh from the Tina Turner Private Dancer album. I worked with some of the most renowned players in the world for that album and then came home to find out my A&R guy had been fired and the new guy chose Tiffany over me. So there wasn't even time to think. Things were just like bang, 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 bang. <laughs> I think back now on on everything that went down, and I'm kind of surprised I'm not crazy, but, well, maybe I am. Maybe that's why I'm still here, is because I'm crazy. (laughs) In thinking of this theme of starting over, I was kind of shocked by how, right back to back, over a couple-year period, when you left the headpins, and then you got that opportunity in London, then that fell through. Those were two back-to-back experiences. And I'm just wondering, how did you recover and regain your self-confidence, especially after losing the London opportunity, that recording opportunity, and being forced to start over again? Well, it gets back down to what's in your heart. What is it that makes you happy? you got to have balls to stick with that. But if you can muster that up, I think it works that if you just keep trying, eventually that wheel spins around and that clog fits. And having my husband was very supportive at the time. He stuck with me. And I had some wonderful friends that really believed that I had the ability to try again. Because there's no guarantees, of course. But just keep trying. After you finally released your solo album in 1991, you received a Juno nomination. You were on the radio. But you left music not too long after. What challenges did you face during that period of your life? Well, what had happened at the time was... I got it back together, and then the headpins got back together for a short time. It looked like there might be record company interest and stuff, and a bunch of contracts hit my desk, and they were thicker and less giving than when I was 20 when I signed them. And I'm like, I didn't spend the last 10 years so that I could make less. 
there has to be something in here to make me want to stay. And basically all it was is you want to be a part of this, you have to sign over everything. So I chose not to. And of course, then that was another big shit show, pardon my language, but that didn't end up very well either. And at the time, during all of this, I was working on solo stuff already. So we had managed to find a label in Montreal that was interested. And then for some reason, all of a sudden, they weren't returning our calls right at the same time I stepped outside of the headpins box again. So I think I got blackballed there. But shortly after, I got picked up by Warner Music in Toronto, and they heard the tunes that I had already in place, and they jumped on board, and we finished the Never Look Back album. They produced one video for me, and that came out, did okay. There was a, the Cry To Me video, and then released music-wise three more songs to radio, but did not support it with video. And at the time, you had Michael Jackson and Madonna doing half a million dollar videos and getting radio support and much music support and MTV support. And I had nothing other than some radio support, which is wonderful. But if you can't back it up with video, which was the star, <laughs> video killed the radio star of the day, the sales, I reached 35,000 copies at the time that they dropped me, which is about a year into what was supposed to be a four-year contract. So it just all of a sudden was bang, it's dead in the water. You no longer have a deal and they've moved on and it was nice knowing you kind of thing. So once again, it's pick up the pieces and what do you want to do with your life? So I'm sorry, I'm uh, reminiscing about things I'd long forgotten about because they do become painful, but... Yeah, I'm sorry if it's too painful. That's okay. <laughs> It does bring up painful memories, but you know, I'm still, I'm, I'm still here and I'm still, I'm still kicking and rocking. And you've also been really honest in interviews. And if you don't want to talk about this, this is fine, but you've had to start over financially. And I know that, especially given this time, how hard it is for people, how difficult was that decision to accept and come to terms with? You had mentioned how I'd quit music. It was after the solo record had been dropped and I realized that there was no more support and I'd got a year's worth of touring out of it. But at that point, I saw not a blank slate. I saw an empty slate. That's how my mindset had altered. And I'd been married at that point for 10 years and we hadn't even had a honeymoon because when we got married, we were in the middle of recording the second album. So I had to stay in the studio. We weren't allowed to go on a honeymoon. And then financially and time-wise, it just wasn't possible. So we went away on a honeymoon and came home and it was time. It's like, it's time to have babies. And so we made a baby. And while I was pregnant, the drummer from the Headpins, who was not working with the Headpins either, was in a club band and called up and said, do you want to come and sing with us? We can get you a little bit of money. And so that started. And a year into that, he booked us in Edmonton, I do believe, and we got off the plane and walked into a limousine driver with a sign saying headpins. And at the time, I was in the middle of what ended up being a seven-year lawsuit because I was sued by the former manager of the headpins for the half a million dollar debt the headpins had accrued in the five years that I was in the band, which kind of pissed me off because I got fired. I didn't walk away. So why was the debt mine? I just kept thinking to myself, but it didn't matter. So I was fighting and fighting. So as the story goes, I was expecting to be sent a cease and desist letter after this event happened. And lo and behold, it didn't happen. And so 26 years later, we were still being the headbins out on the road and reached some more wonderful highs during that time and some horrific lows. and had played basement shows and backdoor alley shows and did some wonderful tours with bands like Nazareth, all kinds of wonderful things in that 26 years. But when push came to shove, it became apparent to me that I was not a member of the band. I was an employee of the band and my decisions were not taken seriously. And I lost my mom who I was taking care of, my mom and my dad, in a retirement home here, and lost her suddenly. And six months later, basically, my husband had a heart attack and died in the ambulance in our driveway. They brought him back to life. He flatlined, and they broke 10 ribs, bringing him back to life. But he was very sick for a very long time, and I just started 
why am I not doing what what I want to do with what's left of my time here? I just became very, very aware of how limited time on this plane can be and that you just don't know when that could be. My husband was in the best shape he'd been in his life that since I'd known him when he had his heart attack. So it was unexpected and it just shifted a gear into self-awareness and self-importance in the sense of what do I need to be happy? I was living someone else's dream. I was kind of numb to the situation. It was in drive and that where we were going. We were just driving. So reality hit home really fast and I went to the band with some suggestions and they were really happy with what they were doing and were not in the mood to make changes. And so I took it upon myself to change for me. In 2016, when you chose to leave the band, in some way, was that validating or healing in that you controlled your destiny that time as compared to how you left the band in 85? Oh, for sure. And both times were traumatic. The last one is still traumatic. I've lost friendships that I've had for an adult lifetime. But you got to make those choices. You got to figure out what you want to do and what's right for you. And of course, trying not to be selfish. And yet, I just felt the playing field was not balanced. It was not even. And I felt I had contributed my whole adult life to something and felt very unvalidated by the situation. So it was time to make a move. And now that you're four years on from that move, how does it feel now? Are you where you wanted to be and how you envisioned that when you made the decision to leave? I'm very saddened to say that this year we had broken through some glass ceilings this year, got into some venues that we had been informed we would never get into. And yes, there's politics at play, of course. It's so frustrating to think that we worked for four years. I remastered and re-released Never Look Back, and it's now called Flying Solo. I figured that if I'd spent the last 36 years playing those same 13 songs in a set, that one year that Never Look Back got to be presented to the public deserved another opportunity to see the light of day. So we pulled out that album or that CD, put it on and went, you know what? These songs are still strong in our opinion and they're classic rock. And it, it was me as much, if not more so than the head pins. So well, let's give it a try. So we brought that back to life. And in the midst of the change, somehow a rumor got out that I'd lost my voice. That's why I wasn't in the head pins anymore. And so instead of complaining and trying to clarify or rectify that through social media, it was, how can we do this in a manner that just puts that rumor to bed? It just so happened that Ron Obvious, who was working at Little Mountain Recording Studios, all those years had pins recorded there and then went on to work at Brian Adams' studio, was driving through little old Vernon and stopped at our house to say hello and said, yeah, you know what I'm doing? I'm recording on the road now. I just take my gear and drop it down at a show. And and we're like, the timing in this is so asinine because that's exactly what we need to be doing right now. That's how we answer that rumor. So <laughs> because getting into Vancouver as an artist without representation, because we're an island, we don't have manage or my husband's managing me again, but we don't have an agency supporting us. So we rented our own hall and we did it all ourselves, promoted ourselves, sold tickets and brought Ron in and we recorded the show and released the CD called Live. And so in the first two years of being a solo artist, I put out two CDs. And as of three, four days ago, we have now released four music videos. So in those four years, I've done more than what I had accomplished in the headpins in the past 26. I'm proud of what we've done and we've worked hard and We've spent money we don't have trying to stay relevant or at least present in this crazy market that exists today. Well, just for the record, I was at one of the shows before the pandemic and you haven't lost your voice, so I can attest to that. It was fantastic. It was a great show. And I know how hard you've been working. I follow you on social media. I really see your efforts. And I wanted to ask you, given all the changes in music in recent years, was it tough to adapt to doing everything yourself, like booking gigs, promotion, PR, social media, bringing the crowd, making sure tickets are sold, all of it as compared to the earlier era? It's as tough as anything else that you have to learn, right? And I think that attitude just means so much, makes such a difference. 
if you go into something thinking, I don't want to do this, which I've done many times, I, I have to admit, or if you go into it with the attitude, okay, this is new. What do we got going here? At least now I can control a little bit of where this vehicle is going. Before when it was radio that said what they wanted to say about you or the newspapers that said what they wanted to say about you and used the picture they wanted to use. At least this way, you get to use your favorite picture. You get to say the most important things you feel. So once you get the understanding that there is an upside to this, it means you're working all the time. I don't go to bed without <laughs> without my phone in my hand, making sure I've replied and answered on all the social media platforms that I'm on, making sure I'm I'm trying so hard not to make waves these days. People are so on edge and so willing to jump down someone's throat for saying and giving an opinion. And uh, it's a sad state that we're in. It's just a scary state. So this faceless society that we're in right now, learning how to maneuver through the potholes that exist out there has been very interesting. And I've learned from a few posts and I've had more than a few people message me privately saying, wow, you dealt with that so much better than I would have. And it's like, you know what, I'm not here to create ways. I'm here to try and smooth them out. And in my opinion, I don't want people on my social media platforms yelling and screaming at someone else's opinions. You want to talk about it. You want to listen to each other and maybe come to a, a better place. I'm all game. But if you're going to get on there and just yell and scream and call names and stuff, then you're not welcome. Go away. Go do that kind of stuff on your, on your own platform. So that's where I stand. And sometimes I face a little flack for that. But basically, I think people respect that and appreciate the fact that I won't jump down their throat for having an opinion as long as they post it as an opinion and not everybody else doesn't know what they're talking about. At this stage of your career with the pandemic, what does it mean for artists like yourself if this goes deep into 2021? Are you just taking it week by week? What are you actually doing to adapt? The medley, which we just did, we spent more on that medley than I've made this year. But once again, that was a choice my husband and I decided to make to stay as relevant as possible in this time. And I know that there might be a few people out there that say, ah, it's the old tunes and you're writing on the old tunes. And it's like, here's how it comes to me. Every time I step into a venue, I have handfuls of people that say to me, are you doing this song? Are you playing that song? And they're the headpin tunes. And I say no. And they're like, oh man, that's why I came. So in my heart of hearts, I am not the headpins. The headpins to me were four people back in 1981 that stepped into the studio and did what we did for four years. And then it became a version of. So I'm not that band. And the last 26 years that I was in it, we tried to be that band. And we were, but we weren't, right? Mm -hmm. Brian's not here. And it was his band without any question. But it still has been my entire adult life the voice of those songs and as i keep trying to add a co-writer in a third of them so they do belong to me i did pay the price to be a part of those songs that no one else did as far as the lawsuit so we were doing one third head pins one third originals and one third of the great covers i've always wanted to do that gave my voice a chance to shine in the set so we were saying, no, I don't want to do any more headpins. We are not the headpins. And COVID happened. And we were just so happened to be at a rehearsal just as everything was getting locked down. And the boys in the project said, can we do a medley? And I said, what do you mean a medley? And they're like, of headpin songs. And that way we can play all the songs. And it still only takes up a third of the set. And it was like the light went on. I'm like, you know what? That way I don't have to answer that question, no and have people upset with me anymore because I'm not doing those songs. So we put it together. That rehearsal had some fun. And then COVID happened. And the next gig was getting us ready for this summer's dates. And I had to call everybody and cancel the next rehearsal for the show. They said, well, the medley sounded so good. What do you want to do with it? And I said, if you guys want to do a COVID video, if you, if you want to go home and throw your parts down. And, and so basically, we did that. I put that out there thinking that's ah, never going to happen because two of the guys didn't have home studios. Two weeks later, I got the bed tracks 
and they were phenomenal. I'm like, you guys did it. You put this together. I'm so proud and honored that you took it to heart. So I went out, bought new studio gear and laid the vocals on. And so many things came together just at perfect timing. Then the uh, Rock and Roll Society of Edmonton got involved and they're like, we'd, we'd love to have you present it at our evening of supporting rock and roll. So we said, OK, well, why don't we instead of doing a live live, why don't we actually do a video and turn this into something that we can use as promotion in the future? So. That's what we did, and we ran into Mark Greenhaw, who did the video for Monkey for me three years ago, and he said, I just happen to know a production company in Vancouver who's not working right now because of COVID, and they'd love to do something. So lo and behold, the video came together. After experiencing so much throughout your career, are you able to feel empowered and draw strength from your own story? To know that you really accomplished a lot, you're still surviving, you're still doing well, but you get to the top of the mountain, had to go down the other side into the valleys, but you've climbed another more fulfilling mountain. Are you able to feel empowered by that? You know what? Throughout my life, every five years, basically, kind of, sort of, I have gone and, and taken a straight job. I was a Taekwondo instructor for nine years. I put my two sons and myself through martial arts training. We're all black belts. and. Once achieving my black belt, I was hired on as an instructor and loved the job. I've worked at Zellers. I've worked at Kmart. I've worked at Foot Locker. I've worked at, I can't remember the rest. Oh, I was a, a janitor for five years as well because music did not pay the bills. It paid some of them. With all the success, the artist isn't necessarily the one that makes the money. And so it's not an easy life to pick. It's obviously a passion. And once the bug has bit you, it's really hard to walk away from it. And I believe I've developed a skill and a talent at it that it's not to say it's better than anyone else. It's just, it is what it is. And as a dear friend, Liz says to me, you shine up there, Darb. You can tell you're in your element. It's like, thank you, because it's hard to tell, but I do feel good when I'm doing a good show. So learning that life is a struggle no matter where you go or what you do. So why don't you struggle at what gives you back the most? So if money isn't everything, and it's not everything to me, I'd be rich if that was my key set in life right now. Instead, I'm learning to feel fulfilled with where I've gone and the choices I've made. Not all good, but how does the old saying go? You learn more from your failures than you do your successes. And, and I happen to agree with that statement at this point in time. You mentioned about skill and developing skill with talent. Do you think reinventing yourself is a skill and a talent that you can actually develop over time? I don't think either of those words describe what it is. Mm -hmm. I think it's the core, it's your core, it's your purpose is how badly do you want to achieve what it is you want to achieve? You can bring skill into it for sure. Having skill at what you want to do is probably very integral to being successful at it. But I think that it's just you have to listen to those naysayers and say, that's your opinion. It doesn't make it right. So surround yourself with like-minded people who, who might not necessarily be singers or entertainers or performers, but people that understand that going and being the president of a company to make lots of money so you have holidays doesn't necessarily mean you've achieved your goals. It means that maybe you've made money, but I don't know if I'm kind of off the topic here. How badly, how badly do you want it? Right. <laughs> And what are you willing to give up to do what it is that you believe is your purpose? And that kind of feeds into my last question, which is really just, what advice do you have for anyone out there who's going through a period of starting over, who's struggling with change or, or stuck having to start over, but doesn't know where to start? What advice do you have? I don't remember doing anything in my life that wasn't at some point a struggle and you had to make decisions that were difficult. and you may have failed at it. But 
winners never quit and quitters never win. Um, if you put your mind to it and don't let the failures let you fail, eventually that pendulum or that swing or whatever, that circle will come back around. And if you're ready to go when it does, there's every chance you could win at the chances that you are taking. So you just got to hang in there long enough. Don't let the naysayers stop you or halt you from moving forward. Learn, listen, take criticism the best you can. Learn from your mistakes and just stay positive. It's such a better life when you look at the brighter side than if you're constantly down the rabbit hole because that's just an extra mountain to climb or hole to get out of, right? So just try to stay positive and, and surround yourself with positive people. Get rid of the negativity because that just that doesn't make for anything but more negativity. That's fantastic advice, Darby. And uh, thank you very much. I really want to thank you for doing this and being so vulnerable and honest. Well, my pleasure. And all the best to you. And, and thank you for having me aboard your show. And once again, the only way we get through this is if we band together and support each other and make sure that we're lifting people up as much as possible because everybody needs it right now. Thanks for listening to the Starting Over Drive podcast. Join us next time for another real story of starting over. In the meantime, make sure to follow us on Spotify, YouTube, Amazon, Stitcher, and all major podcasting platforms. Head to the Starting Overdrive Facebook page, follow us on Twitter, subscribe to our channels, help us grow, and feel free to share your story of starting over. Or even let us know if you relate to any of the issues touched upon in our interviews. You can also find us at the Starting Overdrive podcast at the official site, www.startingoverdrive.com. Mm-hmm.